Are you going to go to it again or do you not want to go no. to it once? Right. Mm-hmm. I didn't even think you only needed one. Yeah. Yeah. But they have information, they have workshops on freedom of information, and you can run regulation of your own. Um, and I'm going to do one of good meetings. And good evening, everyone. <coughs> Welcome to the uh, February 25th planning board meeting for the town of Scarborough. We'll call this meeting to order. If you'd all please join me in rising from the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Tony, could you please do the roll? Mr. DePerry? Here. Ms. Henderson? Here. Ms. Saunders? Here. Mr. Feely? Here. Ms. Rob, uh, Vlad, sorry. Here. And Chairman McGee? Here. Uh, just a quick housekeeping note, we do have two new appointments to this board. I'd like to welcome uh, Jen Ladd and Rick Meinking, who unfortunately can't be here this evening. Um, but welcome to the planning board. And buckle up. <coughs> so we have uh, <coughs> next item on the agenda is the approval of the minutes from February 4th. Uh, we have to table those. They are not quite prepared yet. So I'll make a motion to table the minutes. Second. And this motion and a second. All in favor? Unanimous, thank you. Um, next item, Contour Properties, LLC, request a subdivision amendment review, Science Park subdivision for sci- 8 Science Park, Assessor's Map R77, lots 3A and 3B. Good up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this project's located in the Business Office Research and Shoreline Overlay Zoning Districts. As the board may recall, uh, you all uh, granted a conditional approval for the subdivision amendment back in May of 2018. However, one of the conditions required uh, that that the zoning districts adjacent to the property be added to the plan. This condition specifically referred to the Shoreland Overlay and Resource Protection Districts, which are located along the northerly property boundary. The applicant has determined the exact location of these districts and has provided this information on the plans. The applicant should be sure to discuss this with the board. Given that the approved plans were unable to be recorded within the required 90 days, the applicant is seeking final approval from the board tonight. I just wanted to note that no other changes have been made to the plan since it, as approved, other than that, uh, just the adding of the addition of the zoning districts as required by the conditions. Uh, staff is comfortable with the plans as provided and has provided the board with a motion for your consideration. Thank you. Thanks, Jamal. And uh, just as a reminder to the general audience and any applicant coming to speak before us, uh, no need to rehash any old business. Uh, Free to try to keep your comments focused on the new business at hand. Thank you. Hi, good evening. My name is Mike Tadema Whelan. I'm a civil engineer with Teradyne Consultants. I'm here with uh, Bob Goudreau and Bill Beschenstein, uh, who make up Contour Properties, the owner and the applicant tonight, the owner of uh, Science Park Subdivision. Uh, so as Jamel mentioned, we were here uh, a little less than a year ago uh, with this plan. Uh, it was approved by the board. There was some uncertainty surrounding the actual location of the shoreland zone, the resource protection and the associated 250-foot shoreland zone. Uh, <clears throat> and as one of the uh, conditions of the prior approval was to add that to the plan. That required uh, some extensive field work, as it turns out. Uh, so we engaged Albert Frick Associates as well as Morse Envi- Environmental Consultants to help us out with that. The field work was uh, and the analysis was completed back in December, and, uh, and at that point we, we compiled it, brought it to Brian Longstaff, the code enforcement officer, as well as Jamel and, and uh, Jay Chase, um, who, uh, who found the, the, the analysis uh, acceptable. So. We're here tonight with uh, essentially the same plan that was previously approved, except for the addition of the shoreland zone. And I'll point it out on on the board I have. I've colored it up um, so it's a little easier to see. So the the this this sort of darker blue area. This this is a actually a coastal wetland. Uh, the, the Nonsuch River experiences some tidal um, influence 
up, way, uh, up in this area. So this, uh, this shaded blue area is, is sort of the extent of what was determined to be coastal wetland um, and is, as defined by the Shoreland Zoning Ordinance, is a resource protection district. And then this sort of green, lighter green area is the 250-foot shoreland zone. So you can see it comes onto the property uh, a little bit onto this corner of, of the site. Um, and of course, when we, when we come back for site plan approval for the individual um, uh, condominium units, uh, we'll, we'll have to meet those shoreland zone um, design standards. So, uh, you know, we believe it's a, a just a, a simple addition to a plan that unfortunately couldn't be recorded in time, and, and so tonight we're asking for uh, final approval uh, once again of this plan. Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, there's an opportunity for public comment on this item. If there's anyone here that wishes to speak on the topic, I ask you to go ahead and please approach the uh, podium. Seeing none, I'm going to close public comment. Um, this is relatively straightforward. Is there anyone here on the board that has any uh, questions in particular? Seeing none. Oh, sorry, Rachel. Go ahead. Silly. Um, yeah, I noticed that the comment was made in the, um, I believe, in the staff comments about the uh, building a sidewalk along Route One. Has there been any thoughts about that? So the applicant uh, continues to, I think, oppose the idea of building a sidewalk on that side of Route One, um, essentially for the for the fact that it. it doesn't get uh, a pedestrian anywhere, really. Uh, you know, as, as you go south on Route 1, uh, you run into the, the, the Route 1 divides, uh, and that there's no chance uh, to sort of cross Route 1 at that point, and there's no, no real chance to, to cross the, the exit off, uh, off of the, the connector, the 295 connector. Um, so he, again, uh, continues to oppose the, the idea of that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, can, can I add to that? Um, sure. We actually met today. We're working on the Route 1 corridor study, and part of the conversations with our um, consultants is really reworking a lot of this area with the connector. It is obviously, if you look at an aerial view, it's a very highway, because yes, you're coming off the highway in that transition and really changing the appearance of this corridor, specifically between um, Green Acres and Pleasant Hill. So I think a lot of change might be coming in the future. Um, and so I just, as a, an alternative too, you could, um, a lot of times the, the, boards, the board considers doing an in-lieu fee for sidewalks or things like that because we will be looking at this corridor specifically in this area and how you get bikes and um, peds through here. So maybe it's not, necessarily a sidewalk, but it could be for um, bicycles and other things, because that's really going to be a focus for this study that we're working on currently. So just throwing it as a topic for discussion. Thank you. Um, does the applicant have any thoughts as to uh, contributing to a multimodal account in lieu of a sidewalk? Have you had that conversation? I've not had that, had that conversation with my client yet. This is the first we're, we're sort of hearing about the, the recent changes. Um, I, got a, I have a question for staff, which is um, clearly they're going to be back mm -hmm. with any more improvements to this site. Uh, perhaps this is something that can be hashed out a little further along your way before you return back to us with you know, the next set of building plans. Yeah. I, I, would I, would, be, I would think that would be it a good course of action. Staff will be happy to work with the team on those logistics. Okay. Um, yes, Roger. No. Are you all done with this, this particular topic? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Okay, I just want I just wanted to comment. I took a ride up to see the work that you've done on the existing, the, I believe it's the old foundation for blood research, and it's really, uh, they did a terrific job, so looking forward to seeing everything else, and maybe even with some sidewalks. <laughs> Any other questions? All right. That said, I do have a motion prepared this evening. I move to approve the project titled Science Park Subdivision proposed by Contour Properties, LLC, as depicted on the plan set prepared by Teradyne Consultants, LLC, dated 2-1-19, with the following findings and conditions. Findings as stated here written, 
The conditions are, one, prior to the signing and release of the Mylar, the final subdivision plan shall be revised to include the town standard subdivision notes. Two, final approval from the Scarborough Sanitary District is required prior to further development. Approval documents shall be provided to the planning department when received by the applicant. That is the motion. Second. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? I'm sure that that's unanimous. Thank you. Good luck, guys. Next item on the agenda this evening is um, Zoe and De Development LLC requests a final subdivision review for 28 Burnham Road, Assessor's Map R001, Lot 10. Jamel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Teeing it up on the board here. So this project is located in the RF uh, and Aquifer Protection Overlay Districts, and as you said, at 28 Burnham Road. Uh, the applicant's proposing a 20-watt uh, residential conservation subdivision. As the board may recall, uh, you all granted preliminary approval uh, for this project at your last meeting in early February. Uh, since the last meeting, the applicant has revised the plans to include a large portion of the open space to be conveyed to the Scarborough Land Trust. Uh, so the applicant should discuss this process with the board tonight. Staff has suggested that the applicant provide the homeowners association agreement and includes language about how the remaining open space area is proposed to be maintained. Uh, staff was also able to meet with the applicant's team to discuss the proposed stormwater management features and roadway design since the last board meeting. Uh, staff is generally satisfied with the stormwater management approach, but has recommended that the, that the board require a lot grading plan to be submitted with each building permit application to ensure that the intent of the stormwater design is being met. Staff has also recommended that if changes in the direction of the runoff deviate from the overall grading plan, the design engineer will need to confirm that the stormwater system as approved uh, will be adequate. Staff would also like to point out that the applicant's requesting a waiver uh, for the pavement width for the streets in the project uh, from 24 feet to 22 feet, and staff is comfortable with this request. Um, staff is comfortable with the remaining elements being conditions of approval and has provided the board with a motion for your consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Janelle. Would you like to introduce yourself and your project, please? Sure. Steve Blake. I'm with BH2M, um, representing uh, Missoulian Development for uh, the Ridgewood Farm Project. Um, I won't reiterate too much of what Jamel said, but um, the, the plan hasn't significantly changed uh, from when, we, when you saw it two weeks ago uh, for preliminary subdivision. We have, uh, we, we've addressed, uh, we've addressed all the, the town comments that we've received to date. Uh, we've added uh, a couple notes to the subdivision plan um, specific to um, like how the buffers get demarcated um, and then also the, the lot grading note that, that, that was suggested. So those, those notes have been added to the subdivision plan. Um, and then we've also, we've submitted the deed restriction language for the stormwater buffers. Um, and also an updated uh, uh, homeowner's covenants for uh, specific to the open space and how that gets maintained. Um, with, the, with the open space, so the, uh, that, that hasn't changed either other than we've um, edited the notes a bit on the subdivision plan just to specify which areas are going to be offered to the Scarborough Land Trust. So, so the bulk of the open space kind of on the, the western half of the property, um, about 30, 29 acres of the open space is being offered to the land trust. Um, and then the remaining, there are two remaining parcels kind of near the entrance um, off of Burnham Road that would remain with uh, the homeowners association ultimately. Um, and that was mainly because the, the land trust, they, didn't, they don't have land that abuts those, uh, those two areas. They're isolated areas and there wasn't interest in those. Uh, and then the third area is the area uh, between lots, lots 13 through 17, there's a kind of a sliver of open space. That was the other area that um, the land trust would, would prefer not, not to take. Um, and Rich Bard, who's with the Scarborough Land Trust, is here tonight if um, there are any questions that come up. Um, as Jamel mentioned, there's one waiver that we would um, like the board to consider. The, the road width that we've uh, designed is 22 feet. I believe the standard is, is 24 feet. It's something that we've talked to staff about, I've talked to Angela with, so that's our one, one waiver request. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, 
There is an opportunity for public comment on this item. Is there anyone here from the public that wishes to speak? Please approach the podium. Seeing none, I'm going to close public comments. Um, quick question before we jump into it. Angela, is there anything that you felt like you needed to kind of supplement here in regard to either stormwater or buffering or anything related to those items? Um, no, I think what's, like Steve had said, I, we sat down and actually not only met with Steve, but the, act the applicant, which is really just to ensure that they knew what they're proposing and what he's going to build is the same thing. And so that's where the notes came in, just to clarify that. So when, when billing permits come in, there's no surprises on either side. So I think Steve did a good job, I think, addressing those and putting those, those notes on the plan. So I appreciate that. Thank you, Angela. And I do have a quick question for uh, Mr. Bard, um, if you wouldn't mind uh, taking the podium. <coughs> At this time, do you, do you foresee it being pretty likely that the Scarborough Land Trust would, would take possession of this land? I, I do think so. It meets our strate strategic criteria for accepting new land. We have a deliberative process that has to go through several stages of review before we take a piece of property. Because once we take it, we keep it forever. So we have to be absolutely sure what we're agreeing to. So we're kind of going through that process. Uh, we'll actually be talking about it this Thursday, probably at, at a couple of different levels. So I anticipate that we should be able to have an answer relatively soon. Thank you. I appreciate sure. it. And then that said, I will, uh, Rachel, do you want to start this one off for us? Oh, sure. Um, I had asked a question before about the mail truck. And given that you are looking at the 22 feet on the road, is the mail truck going to be able to turn around? on the street or find alternative means of turning around? Um, I have not run a turning movement, but um, I, would, I would guess he may have to go up and use the turnaround to do that. Um, again, it's, it's not, we, we didn't necessarily want to propose it this way, but this is, this is how, mm -hmm. the, the, how they want us to do it with a, with a clustered a clustered mailbox close to the main road. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. Uh, Rob. Oh, sure. <clears throat> Can you just refresh our memory why um, you need the waiver for 22 feet, Stephen, versus 24 feet? Um, <clears throat> the, so the, we only have curb on, on one side. Um, mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, I, I guess a typical... A typical lane width for a road of this speed and this number of units, 11 feet is um, may, maybe even wider than what you would typically need. Um, sometimes you can go down to 10. So, uh, I mean, it was something that we, we did discuss with, um, with staff early on, and it, it sounded like that was a waiver that had been granted in the past for um, similar projects. Will the speed limit be restricted to reflect that? Um um, Short, sort of narrow areas. I mean, I guess the if it's signed or whatever would probably be more up to uh, public works. Typically, I don't think you would. Will they be town roads or private roads? They'll be built to a town standard and offered to the town to be accepted. What, and uh, I guess my question is then for staff, what's the likelihood of the town accepting them if they're less than standard, if they're 22 versus 24 feet? I think what, what Steve is talking about is early conversations we had with Public Works and myself um, and, and looking at ways to reduce impervious cover. And so in a rural setting like this type of subdivision, we do actually start usually a conversation with asking, is there, is there ways to reduce the impervious area? And that's one that um, Public Works has found that 11 feet works for them in this rural setting, as, as Steve has said, especially with one side open to shoulders, you get into more restricted areas with curb mm -hmm. and other things like that, then we start talking about other things. Um, uh, where it's only one side, I think this is an opportunity. Great. Thank you. I appreciate that. And then um, can you just specify how the, um, the no disturbed stormwater buffer and easements will be demarcated? Are you planning a Boulder or what type of hardscape, a fence or posts or what are you proposing at this point? Two things: they'll be um, they'll be pinned um, by our by our survey staff, but then also we're proposing um, three foot diameter boulders at twenty five foot spacing to, to demarcate that. Twenty five feet? I think that's enough. Um, yeah, I do. I mean, it's a good visual buffer. 
Um, what percentage of the land being conserved is upland? Is the majority, I guess what I'm looking for, is the majority of it wetland? The, the majority is not wetland. I don't know specifically. Okay. I mean, I would say I would say the majority of it is, is upland. Great. Okay. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Uh, I'm, I'm all set. Rick. Um, I'm all set, too. Jen. I'm all set. Well, everyone seems to be satisfied. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I have a motion here. I will read it. I move to approve the project titled Ridgewood Farm Subdivision, proposed by Zoe and Development LLC, as depicted on the plan set prepared by BH2M, dated 1-18-19, with the following findings, waivers, and conditions. Findings as stated in, in the motion. Uh, waivers permit uh, permit the requested road width of 22 feet instead of 24 feet. The conditions: one, prior to the signing and release of the mylar, plan set shall be revised to address the following: a plan note indicating that the do not uh, that the no disturb stormwater buffers and stormwater easements be demarcated by boulders or another hardscape feature b a plan note indicating that schematic lot grading plan be required to be submitted with each building permit application to ensure that the intent of the stormwater design is being met any changes in the direction of stormwater runoff that deviates from the overall grading plan which is on sheet 1b and the post development watershed map sheet b will need to be reviewed with the stormwater management calculations and confirmed by the design engineer prior to the issuance of a building permit. This shall be reviewed and approved by the planning department. Two, prior to the release of the mylar, the applicant shall A, execute and record the maintenance agreement as requ required by the post-construction stormwater management ordinance. B, provide the homeowners association agreement for plan uh, planning staff to review and approve. The agreement shall include language explaining how the portion of the open space owned by the HOA will be maintained. Three, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall pay the traffic impact fees. Four, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall pay a recreation contribution fees of $250 per lot. Prior to this, five, prior to the start of construction, a pre-construction meeting is required. The meeting shall include appropriate town staff, the developer, their site contractor, and is to be coordinated through the planning department. Second. And a second. Any discussion on this board? No, all in favor. So that as unanimous. Thank you very much and good luck. Thank you. <clears throat> Item number seven, we have Magenta LLC request a master plan review as part of the plan development project for 40 Hikers Parkway, Assessor's Map R50, Lot 35. Jim Hill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So this project is located in the Hikers Parkway Zoning District, uh, located along the western side of the parkway. Uh, the applicant was last in front of the board at your last meeting in February as well uh, for the review of the site inventory and analysis phase. The applicant's in front of the board tonight for review of the conceptual master plan. This review process is required for projects located in the Hygus Parkway zone that include five or more acres. So the conceptual master plan is intended to generally lay out how the plan development will be developed, including the proposed use of various parts of the site, the primary road and pedestrian network, overall approach to stormwater management, proposed development areas, proposed open space and buffer areas, and the de development standards that will apply to the overall development. The board shall approve the master plan only if it finds that it complies with the zoning standards and is consistent with the site inventory and analysis and reflects a reasonable utilization of the site given both environmental and built environment considerations. Staff found that the conceptual master plan is mostly consistent with the site analysis plan. However, the portion of land containing units F and D appear to be located within an area on the site analysis plan identified as not recommended for building development. The applicant should be sure to discuss the development plans for this portion of, of the site with the board this evening. Staff would also like to point out that the applicant is proposing to locate the stormwater treatment features within the required 25-foot streetscape buffer along the Hygus Parkway frontage. Typically, stormwater features are not allowed to be located within the streetscape buffer. The board should be sure to provide feedback in regards to this proposal to the applicant and staff this evening. As noted in the staff comments memo, the exact driveway location will need to be coordinated with the Scarborough Downs redevelopment project. The applicant should be sure to discuss this coordination with the board. And staff has also provided a host of review comments uh, and has provided a draft motion for the board's consideration tonight. Turn it back to you. Thank you, Jamel. Mm -hmm. 
So please state your name and introduce the product. Hey, good evening. My name is Caleb Barass. I'm coming from Stantec Consulting Services here in Scarborough. And I'm here on behalf of uh, the owner here, uh, Carrie Anderson of Magenta LLC. I'm here to discuss, uh, as you just stated, the uh, master plan phase for the project here at 40 Aegis Parkway. So we were last year uh, in front of you at the last planning board meeting for the site analysis phase where we discussed the existing conditions and uh, overall suitability of the site in our recommendation. So here I'll, I'll just point out to our master plan that we have here. Uh, our conclusions, we came to uh, the uh, decision that we would uh, build on uh, the northern portion of the site here. So we have, uh, or we came to this decision really for three kind of main reasons. Um, really the existing infrastructure, uh, utilities that were uh, located along Hagas Parkway, uh, specifically the uh, sanitary sewer that we have. Uh, there is an existing line with a manhole uh, in the right of way on the northeast side of our property there. And um, most other utilities are actually across the street, but this was kind of the driving factor. <coughs> so. Uh, especially because we kind of have a long, slender site and uh, with the layout of these buildings that, you know, we wouldn't want to run uh, too much, uh, you know, going down 2,000 feet down to the other end of the site. So that, uh, as well as stormwater relief, uh, right, up, right to the north of the site, there's an existing culvert that runs to the east across Hagas Parkway, and that's kind of our main point for stormwater relief. So again, um, you know, long site, very thin. Uh, we don't want to be too deep in the ground by the time we get over there. We're going to have some, you know, some elevation issues there. And then finally, uh, just the overall cost of it. Um, as we probably went over here uh, in the site analysis phase, um, the existing portion of the site that you can't really see on the master plan here, but it's a cleared area, and that was originally used by the uh, DOT. They were the uh, original owners of the site here, and that's just mostly fill. So you have, you know, over 10 feet of fill, in this area that would have to be excavated out and then uh, you'd have to bring in some uh, you know, material suitable to build on, uh, which, is, which would be very costly to the owner here. So in doing so, there's an existing uh, control of access along Hagas Parkway and uh, the break in this control of access actually does come out where we have our uh, field location here. And so we're proposing to move this uh, break in control of access where you can see it now over by uh, building number one and so we have uh, been in coordination with the DOT and uh, we'll be moving further with our application to them to, uh, to move this control, or break in the control of access. So um, let's see here. And so just to discuss um, one of the main points that the staff had commented on, um, we have uh, a portion of the site does at, at the uh, southerly side, uh, we are moving into this uh, or building in the, uh, this proposed fill area as it exists today. And um, so I'd just like to kind of clarify, as, it, as we presented it in our site analysis, um, that, uh, you know, although we have, um, you know, a lot of fill in this area have to be excavated out, you know, we're not, we're not basing our whole design on this area. And so portions of it can be built uh, specifically for parking uh, because we won't have to excavate out as much. And, you know, you're not, you're not going to have a load uh, typical to like a building as you would have here. And then also to note, uh, on the very southerly side of the uh, field, you have uh, the deepest amounts of fill, which could be, uh, it's definitely over 10 feet, and then moving northern on the site, um, especially where we have our parking here, you have uh, probably about five feet of fill, which we have in our uh, boring logs that we did submit uh, in the site analysis phase there. So uh, now talking about our, uh, our master plan and how we have it laid out here. Uh, we've had these three buildings. Building number one is uh, most northerly. It's about 10,000 square feet. And then the buildings two and three are 12,960 square feet. Uh, and we have, uh, so you're going to enter through our proposed uh, break and control of access here, um, just to the side, uh, just inside of our uh, building number one. And you have this main drive that's going to be on the easterly side of the site. So a car is going to come in off of Hagas Parkway. Um, you know, turn uh, right or left, or you're going to enter, and then you have all your parking in between into the sides of the site. Uh, another comment that we had was for building number one, we do have parking in front of the building. And uh, we did this, we had a, a smaller building size here, um, and we couldn't really find uh, very good space for our extra spaces here. We have proposed about 84 spaces in total. 
and um, to meet uh, our requirements for at least building number one here, we had to kind of fit those in front of the building. Um, you could look off to, you know, northern on the site, you know, why can't you fit some spaces off on the side there? Uh, we don't really show it here very well, but uh, you have quite a bit of topography on the northern part of the site where you're going to be chasing grades um, down into, uh, into the uh, edge of the property line there, and then we're going to lose a lot of our, uh, of, our, uh, of our buffers essentially up through there too. So um, for each building also, uh, they're going to be split uh, evenly right down the middle, as you can see, uh, into two units per building. Going to be primarily used for a small portion of office space and light industrial. You've got uh, two loading docks per unit. Uh, one is going to be uh, well below grade, and then one will be uh, at grade where you can drive right up to. Um, 84 spaces, as I mentioned before. Uh, each unit will receive uh, one handicap space, so a total of six spaces there. And um, we're going to have, uh, you know, proposed uh, transformers, uh, dumpster pads, all those other kind of site amenities. We're going to try and um, put those towards the rear of the site, you know, try to have them away from uh, uh, the public kind of view uh, off of Hagus Parkway there. And um, another thing to note is um, our kind of plans to actually build out this planned development. Uh, first, you know, hopefully we're going to be back here pretty soon to talk about our actual site plan application. Uh, but we're going to be proposing uh, building number one will be first. And so in building it uh, like this, you know, it's going to be um, as efficient of a design as we can do where you're pretty much going to build uh, building number one and then just move further south down the site, uh, number two, and then number three after that. So in doing so, you've already set up your, your, two, your utilities, um, you, you know, like your sewer across there. And then after that, you're just building out, adding onto the pavement, adding onto your utility stubs, and uh, trying to impact uh, what you've already built. And uh, so you don't have to, um, you know, eat up some more cost. And, uh, you know, uh, I apologize. And just uh, mess with that even further is what I'm essentially getting at. So moving on to um, our grading and drainage through the site, we're going to take advantage of the existing topography, which I don't really show very well here. But uh, essentially, the site grades uh, naturally from the west to the east, so from the back of the property to the front towards Hagus Parkway. And uh, we're going to pretty much sheet grade all the way through there. The, uh, the well uh, loading docks will have uh, some catch basins in them that will get into our, it will tie into our existing stormwater infrastructure that runs uh, from south to the north, which I'll go into a little bit further. So we have, uh, as was mentioned earlier by the staff, we're proposing uh, these bioretention filters, which is an approved BMP uh, through the state DEP. And um, these, uh, we're putting these in the right of way because essentially, you know, we have a very uh, long, slender uh, piece of land here where you don't have uh, the luxury of a lot of space and then, uh, uh, I mean, I should say not a lot of space, but where you don't have uh, as much space as you like in the areas that you would want it. So like I mentioned before, you know, our main point of stormwater relief is to the north where we have an existing uh, culvert there. But given that we have, you know, over a thousand feet here from the very southerly part of our development to the north, um, we're playing with uh, pretty shallow uh, grades uh, for uh, pipes to run all the way across. So we're using these uh, bioretention filters that are essentially rain gardens. They're going to be completely planted. So we believe that that would be something that would be appealing to the board uh, because they're going to be planted with um, various shrubs, perennials that will survive for uh, hopefully many years. And um, these are also very, um, they're not as deep as you would get as a for a traditional stormwater treatment, um, such as like a, a detention pond. So that was uh, our main basis for that. And um, so there'll all be, uh, the water will sheet from west to east, as I mentioned, uh, off of the pavement into uh, all these rain gardens where they'll be treated, uh, brought out into um, what is our storm drain line. You can see that's uh, in yellow uh, on the plan. And that goes, like I uh, mentioned, from south to north on the site there. And then eventually uh, drains into uh, the culvert that crosses uh, Hakus Parkway. So as uh, far as utilities, I mentioned before, another driving factor for um, our location and, uh, for the development on the site is uh, the existing uh, sewer infrastructure on Hagus Parkway. So in the original development of Hagus Parkway, which was uh, probably about the time I was a little boy, 
<laughs> was uh, they uh, added in this um, existing sewer manhole across the street that would benefit our lot and uh, others as well. And you have, um, so we're going to connect into that, get across to uh, building number one, and then like most of our other utilities, we'll run laterally along our uh, main drive. And uh, so I believe as another part of the background to this, the sewer runs into uh, the gravity drain here that runs up north to a pump station that, uh, where we have a gravity line that runs south towards Route 1. Uh, gas, electric, uh, other communications, those are located across the street. And uh, so we're planning to propose um, a, a trunchless uh, installation of all these facilities so as to not um, provide any disturbance to uh, the regular flow of traffic down Hagas Parkway because we know how essential it is for traffic movement from Route 1 uh, to I-95 and Payne Road <coughs> as well. And um, water, there is uh, existing water, 12-inch uh, mean, that is on our side uh, in the right-of-way on Hagas Parkway. And uh, that was another staff comment, was we have um, all of these uh, uh, water services that are running to each building. And um, this is uh, still kind of subject to coordination, our, our coordination with Pu the Portland Water District. But uh, I believe that they may require a separate service to each building. So I just wanted to note that, but that, uh, that the uh, staff comment has been noted, and we'll, we'll look into that further, whether we can actually just take, uh, come off the main line, uh, right up, uh, say, our drive, and then go laterally like we have our other utilities there. So next, moving on to uh, our landscaping here. Uh, we noticed uh, that the staff commented on um, buffering to the west, which is in the rear there, uh, where there is a residential uh, uh, property there as well and so we'll provide we'll make sure that we provide uh, enough uh, landscaping um, and or um, using uh, using uh, vegetation and or fencing I mean um, so that we can uh, satisfy the owner to the uh, west there and then also um, any other properties slash um, part of Pegas Parkway to the south and um, so along with this we have you know keep in mind our uh, bioretention uh, filters that are also uh, spaced out in our 25-foot uh, buffer along um, the uh, easterly drive there. But I will note also we do have, you know, this uh, fielded area to the south, but uh, in the darker green there, you do have this existing um, up to 50 feet of existing um, kind of thinly forested area where there's um, there are trees you know you go from pine to uh, birches in through that area and then also um, some shrubs bushes um, more closer to the ditch line on Hagas Parkway that we believe will also serve as a uh, as a good buffer you know on top of um, our plantings that we're proposing here within our 25 foot buffer on top of that um, so if you would move on to uh, the next slide that we have here I'll, I'll uh, ask uh, Carrie to uh, come up and just discuss um, kind of the elevation and uh, design of the building here. Good evening, Carrie Anderson. So based on the elevation that we submitted at the first meeting, um, listening to the board's comments about looking for something that was um, I guess appropriate for the area and also maybe progressively. I reached out to a guy that I do a lot of work with. He's an architect in Boston. And this building design that you see in front of you has come from a Boston, um, it's a tech park. And it's essentially a metal building with uh, the way that we've got the metal arranged on it. And he couldn't be here tonight, I apologize. He will be here for the next meeting. But the way that we've got the metal arranged on there is, um, is in a way that if you look at it, <clears throat> it's, it's different than just looking at what you would consider, consider to be a metal building. If you look at the salt pump building that's down there, I think that looks pretty good. It, uh, it's a metal building, but it's got the right panel design. It's not a glossy metal. It's a flat metal. This is in keeping with that same element here. The other thing that we've done is, <clears throat> with the verticality, that would be one panel design. If you look at where the horizontal panels are, what that has been designed for is 
if you actually if you look at the the uh, glazing area that's essentially right below signage where it's all glass those horizontal panels are the same size so that if we get a change and a tenant or something like that and they're looking for more uh, glass in there we can swap those out with glazing um, so that's a that's a design element that i think looks pretty neat but it also gives us the flexibility later on to take those horizontal panels out and, re and replace them essentially with glass and then the orange is an accent panel that um, just kind of gives it i guess maybe some life if you will beyond the the ordinary uh, design of the metal that we're using on it versus, uh, you know, vertical or horizontal. The horizontal would be what's called a galvalome. So it's a galvanized type of metal, but it's called galvalome, and it's used um, in designs where they're trying to accent um, or highlight an area. At the same time, it's, it's pretty attractive. So I've seen the building. We're you know, this may not give as good of a representation of it, but I've seen the building and it looks very nice. Uh, we're trying to build a building over here that we can, um, you know, economically come out of it alive and at the same time have it be something that's attractive that we can work from as we go and build building two and building three. And I think at the end of the day, the board will be happy with it. I know that we can get it right as far as using the materials we want to use and have it be something that doesn't um, go against what, you know, obviously people are trying to, or what was, you know, eventually thought of for the highest parkway zone. Um, we have height on it that's, uh, that's 24 feet, which uh, the, the roof uh, pitches to the back so the water can just drain straight off the back in the very back of the building. We'll have a, um, a stone, like an inch and a half stone, so it can essentially drain right into that and just drain into the ground. Um, trying to eliminate roof drains and whatnot, keep the penetrations to the roof as minimal as possible. And then the signage that you see was in the responses that we got from the board based on the meeting about, you know, try and have the signage on the building in a way that um, let you know where it's at, but at the same time um, is attractive. And I think that we've done that. We've got two tenant spaces, could be one, probably will be two, uh, but it could be either or. And in that case, um, we've got enough area up there where we can get that done. The only other thing that I guess I'd point out too is the, the, um, the awning um, that hangs over the entry. Um, that again is one of those design elements that we took from that park in Boston and uh, it looks pretty neat. So I think at the end of the day, um, you'll be pretty happy with how it looks. I'd be happy to answer any questions about it. Thank you. All right. So seeing um, this is an opportunity for public comment, if there's anyone here who would like to get up and speak. Seeing none, I will close public comment and turn it over to the board. Roger, would you like to have a go at this? Sure. Um, <clears throat> um, let's talk about the um, that piece of land south, the south portion. Yeah. I mean, what is what's that look like right now? I, I don't recall what it looks like. Is it just barren? Yeah, and that's perfect. Thank you, Jamel. Yeah, it's uh, mostly just kind of the tall grass area, um, and uh, that's. That's pretty much all it's been. It's kind of mounded over, as you can see, so it looks like it has been graded in the past, uh, which it has been just after uh, the DOT was done using it um, for kind of a laydown area and fill. So it pretty much looks like the rest of the land around those other ponds and everything? Yeah. Pretty much? Okay. Um, <clears throat> and I was kind of curious about the, uh, the maybe you know, Jamal, on the zoning on the property behind it, isn't that the property where they there would be for us to put in a, uh, some sort of a catering service or something like that? Uh, correct. It was part of a miscellaneous appeal yeah. uh, for a commercial kitchen. Yeah. Is, 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 that's not part of the parkway, though, is it? What do you is mean? It, is it is there zone for the parkway? It was a, the reason why they were going for the miscellaneous appeals because they were converting a non-conforming use. Okay. Um, so it is in the Haggis Parkway, but it's a non-conforming okay. use. Okay. Um, 
I have no idea what kind of buffering there is right there now between, you know, that was a set, that's essentially a house that's there, I think. Mm -hmm. Yep. And yep. So we're just still, we're still using uh, our 15 foot rear setback there, uh, trying to keep as much as the existing vegetation as we can, and then also planting uh, more uh, trees and shrubs on the rear side to uh, provide screening. Okay. Um, then there was a discussion in, um, in, in the um, comments, staff's comments about the um, pedestrian connections. Mm -hmm. And um, actually I have a question for staff on that too, but I was thinking about this and um, abutting this property is the new, all those apartments, isn't that correct? Yes, sure. Right. So I, I don't know what you're planning in terms of market research, what, what you're gonna be putting in there, but um, I was thinking that um, for, for uh, pedestrian connections, that would be some sort of a connection there, possibly, if you were going to have anything that in there that might interest those people who live there, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. and, and my question to staff is, I was looking at the zoning for the parkway. Mm -hmm. I, I couldn't find where there's any requirements for any sidewalks along the parkway. Did I miss something? Uh, there aren't any requirements. Um, I mean, I can't, I, personally, I can't think of why there'd be sidewalks along the parkway, but. Yeah, currently, you know, things could change with more development, um, but there isn't currently a sidewalk there. And I know there's, there's uh, design, and, you know, requirements for sidewalks once you get in. Mm -hmm. um, so I was just thinking of the, the pedestrian connections internally and especially to that, possibly to that apartment complex. Um, and the, the last comment I would have on, on your page four of your this here, is that what some of the materials would look like, Kerry? Yep. Right. Sorry, I don't know what you're looking yeah, at. Yeah, looking at this here. Oh yeah, that's the building right there. We actually have this on the last, yeah, the last slide right here. <laughs> yes, that's 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 the building. Which one? Uh, well, it, I, oh, that uh, okay. I'm looking at a black and sorry, mm -hmm. I'm looking at a black and white copy here, but um, but the 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 materials that you have on that uh, page, I believe, oh, the, yeah, there they are right up there. So that's essentially the products that we're looking to use right there. Okay. The, the uh, kind of wavy stuff that's laying down would be used in a horizontal fashion, and that's what's called galvalum. It has a galvanized look to it. And the, the third one over to the right, the one that says galvanized siding. That's what we would be looking to use on the on the horizontal area, where I had mentioned to you that those would go over the areas that um, we could swap out if we ever wanted to put in, like say, glazing, <clears throat> and make it glass. Um, gives us the flexibility to do that. And the orange accent panels are just. I mean, that building happens to be orange. We like orange. Uh, but there's other accent panel colors that we could use. We'd probably look to use on building two and building three. But these are the materials that kind of make up that park. Um, it's a tech park. And, um, and, and when you go in there, the buildings are very progressive looking, but they look good. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think we'd like to keep on, kind of continue on with the same theme. Okay. Oops. I just to Roger, want to quickly state, you know, we are in that master sure, yeah, right. plan yeah, yeah. phase here, and architectural and colors and whatnot will come at a later date when it's resubmitted for us. So I don't want to. I'm glad we're getting a flavor for it, but I don't want to spend a ton of time. That's okay. Yeah. What's what's your, what's while you're up there? What's what's the status for the uh, uh, main DOT and, and the downs regarding the. Uh, well, I don't, I don't have an answer for you there. I don't know if Caleb does. Um, I can tell you that we have tried to, my understanding is we've reached out to them and have tried to get feedback from them for a few months here. And last I knew, still hadn't gotten anywhere. So as much as I think we want to try and coordinate with them, I mean, they could be years. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. But um, we've got our... Uh, entrance in a spot that works for us. As I understand it, they're looking and being in that kind of location across the street, somewhere in there. But as I said to Steve a couple weeks ago, I said, well, you know, I, how long do we wait? I mean, I can't wait forever here. I need to get moving. 
and they've got a big project on their hands, and um, you know they could be they could be a long time. So um, as much as we want to coordinate with them, I'm not so sure that we'll be able to do that. Okay, I'm all set. Thank you. I won't ask about windows or anything. <laughs> Next time, um, Jen, do you want to? Um, I just had a question about whether or not you had considered any of the internal green spaces in the parking lot for stormwater treatment. So we did, uh, but looking at uh, kind of cost efficiency, or, you know, um, and uh, talking about, for instance, like proprietary devices, anything like that, um, we, we just decided that that would be too costly uh, overall for the project. And I think that spacing it out, especially in the fashion that we have um, that would, um, you know, provide su sufficient treatment, you know, we've currently designed it for, you know, the basic and general standards of state. And um, I think that it also would, you know, provide just as, um, you know, an aesthetic appeal um, with all the plantings as well. Uh, the other thing that I'd note about, um, you know, proprietary devices, in my experience that we, I don't know, say, you know, more on the southern side of the site, if we'd be able to actually get that uh, relief, like I mentioned, because you know that's over a thousand feet away um, from where we're trying to get to, and we uh, don't have much uh, elevation really to work with. And what is the change in elevation roughly from um, back to front or west to east? And then, do you know that? Sure. Yeah, west to east. I believe we probably have uh, about five feet to play with. Um, but mostly from actually, I'll go more specifically, from the back of the parking lot to the front, um, we're probably proposing about a foot, foot and a half. And then um, from south to north, um, existing grades, I believe we have probably about eight feet. Something like that, eight to 10 feet. Um, that's all I have, thanks. Thank you. Rick. Um, I, I know you did a good you did a good job of, of trying to represent what the building's going to look like from the elevation standpoint, but I was hoping maybe at the next meeting, is there any way you could bring a picture of that building in Boston and just blank out the signage so that we could just get a better idea of what it looks like? I mean, I'm sure it looks fine, but I kind of would like to, I can't tell from the elevation exactly what I'm looking mm -hmm. at, you know what I mean? I didn't know if that was possible. Just a yeah, thought. I think we want to try and have the architect up here. Carrie, could you uh, get up on my face? Sorry about that. Uh, yes, I understand. I think we want to have the architect here so we can elaborate yeah. on that and any other issues that or concerns you might have or questions or whatnot. So right. we'll make sure we do. Yeah. And yeah, that was my only comment. The rest of it, I thought they did a really good job with it. Um, there was one more. You said that uh, that that. that Lot. I don't have a, a topographical map, but that lot pitches from the back to the front. Because mm. I notice there's a lot of, uh, you know, not on that particular, but on one of the prints that you provided, there's quite a bit of water um, in behind it. But um, and I, this is an aquifer overlay zone, right? Too, yes. Isn't it? So um, does that whole lot pitch towards the front pretty much? Yeah. Most of it, it all pitched towards the front in the, in the uh, kind of field fill area that I described. Um, you know, probably half of it, it's all mounded. Half of that probably drains back. Um, but that's all on, on private property. And those, those ponds, that's, uh, if I'm not mistaken, that was, that's an old uh, pit. Yeah. In there. Yeah. Okay. All right. And yeah, you did a good job. That's all. Thank you. Rachel. Yeah, I, this is not an easy lot to work with clearly, uh, and I think you have put a lot of thought into it. I, I'm looking at um, the master plan, yeah, pretty much what's up there, and I, I noticed uh, one of the things that's listed here is area of apparent encroachment. Could you explain what that means? Uh, yeah, so in our survey that uh, we have here, uh, it's, it appears that uh, the, uh, the owner to the rear uh, they have, um, you know, I, I believe like a garden and uh, some, you know, storage units that are that are on our property uh, as it stands. So those would have to be moved. All right. So you have been in, in discussions, and that will be taken care of by the time. 
Yeah, yeah we haven't been in discussions just... with the owner directly yet, but uh, as we move forward with our actual site plan phase, I yeah, believe that, that would be something that would be very important to have taken care of mm -hmm. by the time you, you bring that to us. Uh, I'm also uh, looking at the design building unit A and B is awfully close to the back of the property line. Is that the um, full, do you have the full 15 feet back there? Yeah, we do, I believe. All right, and um, as a matter of curiosity, why do you have the smallest units in what actually is uh, almost the largest area uh, as opposed to um, future building a unit F and E, which starts into the area, uh, is partially on the area that's not recommended for development. Why, why not the smaller building down there? Uh, well, for instance, the, uh, the two larger buildings actually have more depth to them as well. Uh, in, in building number three there, um, you can kind of see where our property lines come to a point. That's, that's probably our deepest part of the property, where I believe we have probably 200 feet plus or minus to play with. And from there, going towards the north, we, it actually slims down so that we don't have as much uh, room to play there. And, um, you know, you can see, as you brought up in that comment, we were pretty close to uh, our 15-foot setback with uh, building number one there already. Well, you're close to it if you have the front parking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. And if you don't have the front parking, you've got ample room back there. Uh, and usually when we look at buildings that uh, propose parking in the front, um, we expect to see, if we're going to agree, uh, we certainly expect to see uh, much more robust landscaping mm -hmm. than you than you have here. So it, when you come before us again, that's something that you need to consider. Um, I would suspect that the front parking will become a discussion, item of discussion. Um, and to any extent that that's mitigated by robust landscaping, that would be helpful to us in, as we take a look at, at what you're doing there. Uh, I also, you know, for folks to get from one building to the other, uh, there doesn't appear to be any any sidewalks or any uh, passages across the parking lot. So I would be interested as you come forward in seeing how you're going to handle both the flow and the pedestrian pedestrian uh, walking from building to building because that's like something that's likely to happen uh, as you go along. Uh, I like the idea that, and we'll bring it up as we, as you come forward again, uh, as you start to talk about colors, and we talk about colors, I would like to point out that orange is probably not in the <laughs> New England vernacular. Uh, there are many other colors that are, and I would uh, suggest that you take a look at that. Um, I am intrigued by your comment about offering some, slight, some different colors or graded colors perhaps on the different buildings as a way to uh, distinguish them. So that would be something as we go forward that I would hope that uh, we can see more of, that we can see some additional thoughts and designs. Uh, you might want to take a look at the colors that are currently on Higgis Parkway just to see how this building, how this complex would fit in. And I think that's all I have right now. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Robin. So the orange to me is reminiscent of, and I'm not sure if you're old enough to remember it, but it was called Grossman's Building Supplies, the orange and white. And so I'm not necessarily sure either that the orange is necessarily palatable for our New England vernacular kind of a thing, but I love the idea of an accent color kind of a thing. So, but again, that's, you know, site plan will get there kind of a thing. Um, but what I'm more interested in, I think, is um, sort of how we're going to work together on getting you what you need as far as front parking is concerned and putting a stormwater BMP in the 25-foot streetscape, both of which are non-conforming. So I think we need to talk about what, what's going to be on the table or what staff need to work with as far as getting you that. And, um, and so... I would propose maybe um, a long-term maintenance plan for, um, for the um, landscaping 
and, and making sure that you're working with a contractor, perhaps one that's worked in the Long Creek watershed, um, managing these rain gardens uh, effectively. And what's probably going to be needed is more than a two-year warranty for the plants. I think a ten, more like a 10-year warranty for the plants and an executed agreement for someone who's, who's very much um, in tune with getting rain gardens to work like they're supposed to. Because I'm with you, I think that a rain garden can be used as that robust landscaping that my colleagues are asking for. Um, but you got to work with staff to, to get them what they need because too many times rain gardens are built and forgotten about and they don't work. And that's, uh, you know, our chapter 419 post construction stormwater management won't let us just build it, forget about it, and walk away. So we're going to be looking for a really robust landscaping plan but also landscape management plan to make these things function in perpetuity. Um, the reason I think that it's so important here too is because we're in the aquifer protection overlay zone. So can you tell me sort of what we're doing with this site to make it meet the aquifer protection overlay standards or to be looking into the future on how we're going to meet the aquifer protection overlay standards? Yeah, I know uh, off the top of my head, I can't list the whole standard, but I know that this is something that we, we have looked at and um, that we will address here in our, our coming site plan submission. And uh, you know, for an instance, you know, we're making sure uh, off the top of my head, you know, we're not going to be, you know, housing uh, chemicals per se, any of these. We don't have any floor drains, um, uh, things of that nature. Yep. Um, but, yeah, so I think it's really important yeah. that we not make sure that, you know, it's not like, say, a home heating oil business there yeah. or a home heating oil technician or, or not just beating up on home heating oil that's what my husband does for a living sorry but any of these type of chemical you're on the right track oil and hazardous materials making sure that those types of tenants aren't necessarily who we're attracting there it's going to need to be you know and and think about it too like even craftsmen woodworkers and things like that could potentially have those um, hazardous materials, you know, sure. sealants and things like that. So, you know, we may need to have an aggressive sort of, um, you know, sort of like condo association kind of agreement in there too, just because of the aquifer protection overlay district. Um, I I know that you want to bring this this probably fabulous architect up from from Boston. And I'm sure there are some really good industrial parks in Boston, but I encourage you to go next door to Saco. Saco has a fabulous industrial park that actually has a lot of rolling green space and open green space that looks really lovely. Um, and it sounds like in a similar vein of what you're trying to accomplish here with some maybe some technical, you know, some uh, biotech and, and those kind of upstarts kind of a thing. So. Um, I know the Saco Industrial Park. I mean, to me, I've, I've driven through it and thought, oh, I wish some of our industrial parks looked like this in Scarborough. So as much as we love to have Boston come to us, look locally, too, at some of those good industrial parks. Um, I'm also um, worried about unsuitable soils. Once you start digging up this old DOT lot kind of a thing, you never know what you're going to find in these old, old DOT lots. And I know you're working with grade, but you got to get down some. So I'm just wondering, you know, if you can make sure that we have a plan that addresses unsuitable soils, making sure what, what we're worried about is that they don't get, I don't know, uh, stockpiled down at that end of the site that's, what's it called, undeveloped, you know, or mm -hmm. not suitable for, sure. yeah, for that type of thing. Um, how many acres of impervious area are we looking at here? We are currently, as you can see, um, on this master plan, we have uh, currently less than three acres of impervious. So what if you had to put all your parking spaces in? Are you going to go over three acres? We had to put in all of our parking spaces. Do you have all your parking spaces that you need? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that's a pretty significant amount of impervious area to add to Willowdale watershed. So um, have you begun discussions with staff about sort of how Willowdale is being addressed? We have not yet, but I think that, um, you know, going forward, um, you know, willing to hear uh, back and forth um, 
if uh, you know these uh, rain gardens will be accepted or not. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that these will be um, you know pretty good uh, use of uh, that as well. I mean, I, I know that draining through there, you know, that'll help with some of the temperature of the mm -hmm. water as well. We're not going to be you know pumping hot water into the streams. Yeah, and, and that's, you know, sometimes some of the things too, rain gardens is, you know, mm -hmm. we don't want it to pond and things like that. So I do want to recognize my colleague who did sure. say, is there something that we can do in the green spaces, whether it's proprietary mm -hmm. or something else too, to get it out of the sun so that it's cooling down kind yeah. of thing. But there, just understand <clears throat> that, you know, if, if you need, if, if we're, it sounds like we're, we've got some negotiating to do, yeah. I think still here kind of a thing, but, um, you know, you're on the right track. Um, are we looking for approval tonight? We are looking this for approval This would be a master tonight. plan request. Okay. So let me just look at that. Do oh, you mind if I just jump in real quick, Robin? Please, Jamal, yeah. You look? I guess I just wanted to ensure that um, the board is comfortable with the stormwater measures within the buffer, because um, the master plan does sort of nail down the design. Yeah. Um, Stealing my thunder here. Sorry, Mr. <laughs> Chair. <laughs> just wanted to throw that out there. Sorry, Nick. Sorry. Yeah, I think uh, just to piggyback Jeez. on what Jamel is saying, um, I think more specifically is whether, you know, we do have the ability as a planning board to okay some of the stormwater features inside of this 25 foot buffer. What we really need to give them direction on is whether or not we're actually comfortable with it. The language in the ordinance pretty much states that it should not be in that buffer unless we have a good reason to allow it. Mm -hmm. as, as more or less the language about, about that threshold. Um, so I think, I think two things here. One, uh, we need a level of comfortableness from this board being expressed at some level. Or two, I need the applicant to really explain to us why this is the best for this site. Mm -hmm. And I, I think probably both of those things should be addressed in some manner. Yeah, I agree. Yeah? Well, when we start with the applicant and just saying, have you looked at the other storm water? You know, what, what other measures have you looked at? Why did you land in this area with this spot? And I'll let you take it from there. And just yeah. yeah, I think the biggest thing uh, for, you know, our, our design team looking at this was, um, you know, the natural gradation of the site specifically. Um, you know, if you're going to be using uh, any proprietary devices or, you know, uh, you know um, centralized kind of... Uh, you know, piping water out through there, you know, you, you're going to be grading towards specific spots around the site where in this situation, I think that is uh, the most efficient kind of design to go from front to back. Um, although we do have, you know, these lower spots where we've got the, uh, the well uh, loading bays there. Um, but I think at the same time, you know, adding in that, you know, a rain garden could be a, a good uh, landscaping feature, although, you know, it will require maintenance. Um, but I think those two kind of mixed together was, would work very well. And, um, it, and as far as um, certain other types, you know, we, we did look towards on the, no the northern part of the site where I did mention we do have some grade there. You know, maybe you, you do try to put something in and uh, make some sort of a pond out of that slope out of that. But at the same time, I don't think that we, we did play with this originally um, using a, a small, uh, small detention pond on the north part of the site. But, um, we didn't have enough, we couldn't get enough volume, and at that point we just started chasing grade where it just wasn't really feasible to do it at the north part of the site there. And um, so looking towards the south part of the site, like I had mentioned, if you're gonna try and grade all the way down this way, you know, you're, you're gonna be quite a bit lower already, and then trying to get all the way back to the northern part of the site where our, the existing culvert is already, that wasn't really feasible. If you do look towards the rear, we didn't want to drain into these existing ponds that aren't on our property. And then more southerly on the site, we actually have a, a bit of a dead zone, which we talked about in our site analysis, where that doesn't drain to anywhere, and that's kind of a man-made wetland um, as it sits right now. So unless we um, put in you know, a, a culvert across the street, uh, which is something that we don't really want to do, uh, there weren't too many options that um, you know, we, we really uh, thought would work well, um, like something like um, like these rain gardens that we're proposing here. No problem. <laughs> um, grading a five foot or an eight foot um, is, is um, I think it's doable. Um, and it's just a matter of getting a bulldozer in there to put it where you need it to go. Mm -hmm. 
kind of a thing, but I know that it affects what you've already done or may have already done kind of a thing. But I think that this is the time to talk about it now yeah. rather than when you're, you know, further down the road and have more engineering plans in it. Mm. So I think we need to be flexible with staff. And so I, I would really want you to talk with staff more about is, is there really something else you can do? Um, because uh, um, I don't want to rule it out just because of natural hydrology. And mm. as you and I both know, that's a low impact development standard. So we don't want to go against that, but we need to look at all options kind of a thing. The other thing, I, I guess, I want to look at staff for a minute to talk about, are these type of buildings, um, could we pitch them to the west and have, do we want to infiltrate the roof line on these type of buildings, know that they, knowing that they won't be uh, sort of manufactured or those types of things where there won't be a lot of um, uh, particulate and pollutants on the roof? Could we potentially push, push the roofs to the west and infiltrate drip line trenches? where it's uh, vegetated, Angela. Yeah, it sounds like that was the design. When he yeah, came okay. I, I was, was going to say, it. I okay. don't mean to interrupt, but I, okay. that <laughs> was uh, probably that? something that I really, oh, really missed I thought I uh, thought of something in the so whole great. presentation. Good job. But okay. um, that, was, that was kind of the key thing from the start. It was like, all right, well, we're going we're gonna to pitch these front to back, and um, you know, there's a portion of our site that we are treating. So um, those will be uh, piped separately to the north. Okay. That's what we're doing with the... With the uh, and that system. goes to your comment about Willowdale, and yeah. we talk about this with DEP in a lot of our pre-application meetings I've had with other projects, um, that Willowdale is threatened, and, and mostly because of the development that's happening in the watershed, but one of the, um, the concerns is chlorides. So um, one of the things that DEP is looking at, and this is something that we have these conversations with them about, is in this watershed doing something different with the roof. It's exactly that. And so that you're kind of already getting ahead of that. But that's really the direction that we've been steering people, um, just because we know they're going to get, they're going to hear it from DEP anyway, um, and trying to coordinate that a little bit. And so you're not doing multiple designs. And so I think that goes back to Robin's original comment about what are you doing about Willowdale? And I think that that could be something that you highlight, not only for us locally, but also for DEP mm -hmm. and how you're addressing that with the roof yeah. runoff. And so then, would we want to make sure then that the rain garden is lined so that any chlorides entering it are not going to go into the aquifer right. protection, the aquifer mm -hmm. that we're right. trying to protect here? So you're looking at lined mm -hmm. rain gardens, not just, um, you know, basically a hole in the ground. Yeah, correct. Thank you. Okay. Rachel. Yeah, I, I knew I'd, I'd forgotten something. And, and I had a, a question about... What are you going to be doing with the whole area that you call not developable? Is it just going to be left to the kind of switch grass that's there now, or? Yeah, yeah, that is our plans for it. And um, if something is to happen in the future, you know, we'll be back before the board. But as of right now, we're not planning to develop that portion of the site. Well, I, I understand you're not planning on developing it, but what are you going to? How are you going to treat it? I, is there going to be um, meadow seeding, natural? local flowers, plants in there? Uh, no, we don't have anything proposed in that area currently, uh, other than kind of the screening that we uh, have off the uh, southerly parking lot area there. Well, I, I would like you to really to, to think about that. Um, that's a fair amount of space that right now looks pretty ugly, uh, and I hope it wouldn't be left that way. Um, one of the things that uh, I sometimes ask questions about and would like to certainly like to see is, is treating that area with some natural landscaping. Uh, we have a lot of beekeepers in Scarborough, um, and uh, seeding that area with native flowers for the bees, um, making it visually a lot better than what's there. I don't mean do you know, fantastically landscape gardens, but look at something that is more than the scrub grass that you've, that you've currently got there, so that it actually beautifies the, the whole area. Uh, and um, at the point at which you might want to develop further down there, you're not pulling up trees or anything else, but 
let's see if it's possible to do some sort of a metascape there. Mm, okay. I do want to just quickly circle back to the um, rest of the board's thoughts on this buffer and the stormwater features within it. Um, is there, based on what the applicant has explained and some of the conversation we've heard at the board level, is there a general consensus here that having the rain gardens with you know maybe the correct uh, filtrations on them and, and protections are okay in this situation. We're okay with it being in this buffer. I just get a, a sense from this board one way or another, um, and I think that really is going to drive you know the applicant and staff's um, conversations as this as this goes through the process. So, um, could I just mm -hmm. could I just recap maybe? So. I understand the, the sort of the, the limiting geometry of the site, you know, sort of that linear, long linear sort of geography that we have or, or geometry that we have. So it's limiting both where the stormwater drainage, the, the stormwater features go, but it's also, it, are we also non-conforming then with respect to the parking that's required out in front of the buildings? I guess, Jamel, I'm looking to... Yeah, so the zoning ordinance um, looks to have the parking in the side or rear uh -huh. um, when practicable. Okay, so... To the greatest extent possible, or however it says. Okay, so this is not considered non-conforming with respect to the parking standards. So long as the front parking is, um, you know, there's a robust buffer to screen it from the okay. public way. So I, I guess what I'm getting at is... Uh, I don't know, and maybe we need more information for the robust buffer. I think the salt pump, too, I believe okay. they do have parking along that front, okay. right on Hygus, mm -hmm. which is their neighbor. Yeah. And I, you know, and I'm just weighing my two cents. You know, we are talking about, uh, was that 75 feet of natural buffer from Hygus to your asphalt on the pavement? Is that about right? Yeah. It's about 75 feet of already natural buffer just because of where the property line sits. Okay. So, you know, I think we talk about robust buffering. When you go by the salt pump, for example, do you feel like, oh, I see the cars, or, you know, this, mm -hmm. and I would, I would argue that I think that that tree line might be a little thinner than, especially in the winter, but in the summer, I mean, I know I've driven by looking for that thing, but I don't know what that is. Yeah, I can't visualize it, I don't go down yeah. that way. So, um, but, yeah, good question about the, you know, conformity. I, yeah, and, I don't yeah. want us to waive something if it's already non-conforming right. for something yeah. else. Yeah. Roger, do you have any thoughts on this rain garden situation and, and buffering? <clears throat> no, I'll, I'll basically uh, go along with what both uh, Angela and our expert on the young level. Basically that there are there is a solution to the applicant's proposal. Yeah. This, Wait. Okay. Jen, do you have any thoughts on this? No, I'm, I'm, that's fine. Rachel? I'm fine. Um. Yeah, I guess I just want assurances that that we'll continue to work together and find a find a, a compromise. Rick? Uh, Kerry Anderson again here. Can I just ask uh, you a couple questions with respect to um, that issue about maintenance and whatnot. <clears throat> I've done work with like Dale Pearson, Pearson Nurseries, um, as far as ponds I've built over the years and uh, him doing the wetland plantings and whatnot. Is somebody doing some work with somebody like that acceptable or? It really needs to be somebody who's worked in urban settings, Carrie, only because you have such a high load of chloride there and the plants really need to be salt tolerant. And you need to work with somebody who's, who's used to that. And, um, you know, Angela is on the board for Long Creek Watershed Management Plan, and she can connect you with, with who you need kind of a thing. Because, you know, I think when we talk about rain gardens and, and ponds and things like that, we're really usually looking at a fairly residential and pristine sort of type of setting kind of a thing. And we're talking, like, really hard-used, like, parking and plowing and salting and sanding. And the plants take a beating kind of a thing. So we, we so got to really... I'm going to jump in real yeah. quick. Yeah. So I, you know, I appreciate that, you know, we definitely want the best of the best all of the time here. That's mm -hmm. not, it's not unusual. What, what I do want to watch out for is how, um, how, 
how we can really work with the applicant on something like this. If we have a standard that we think we can develop and we have a contractor that is somewhat experienced, maybe not to the extent that mm -hmm. we'd like to see, but still experienced in it, and as long as they're willing to you know, implement the standard we seek, I, I don't want to place like the burden of, you must use this particular contractor. On yeah, no, that wasn't so, meaning that at yeah, all. Yeah, I, I, what I want to do, though, is make sure that the standards that we're going to ask them to meet are robust and that the contractor they, they've selected has agreed that they can meet those. Because yeah. that's where the problem yeah. will really arise, is whether or not they're not meeting what the... Absolutely, and the alternative to that would be having extending the guarantee period to make sure that the plants are guaranteed for 10 years over two years versus yeah. two years. And, that's, and use whoever you want. That's good, in, yeah. Yeah, and that's good, I think, for at least the staff to keep in mind when they're working with the applicant on this process of how high we want this bar to be if we're going to allow this um, system to be placed into your buffer zone. So does that make sense, Carrie? Yes. <clears throat> so we can work with staff to identify some people who can help us going forward with that. <coughs> yeah, I, I would just say it, it's actually in our ordinance. In Chapter 419, we talk about them being qualified inspectors and things like that. I think if we start with a plan, it's helpful for staff. Mm -hmm. uh, when you're talking about robust landscaping and you have those plants set, which I will be the first one to say that I can design uh, bioretention, but I cannot do a rain garden because that those plants, you need a landscape architect. You need an expert, like Robin is saying, that knows plants and knows what's salt tolerant and knows their you know longevity, those type of things, which is not a civil engineer, <laughs> which is not me. Yeah. So that's why you need an expert for a landscape architect to actually design it, which I think we require anyway for our landscape plans, correct? Mm -hmm. So we'll need to coordinate that a little bit and make sure that you have someone who's designing it, as well as the inspector we specify in our ordinance who's qualified to inspect, um, and then gets back to those annual reports that come to the town, and then we report to DEP on those that are in compliance or not in compliance. Um, and that speaks to also the, the longevity of, say, a maintenance <coughs> contract or something like that um, to make to ensure compliance. So we can find them, obviously, and, and we will. Yeah, great. Um, just a couple of other comments, if I can. As far as the meadow area over there, planting, you know, some something that bees will uh, roam around and whatnot. I'm sensitive to that. I'm fine with that. Um, that's no problem at all. Um, and uh, and then just to uh, not dive too farther back into the stormwater, but when Steve and I see Bushy, and I first talked about this site, I, I realized that you know we have a wet pond situation in most instances, and we looked at putting a big building on here with a big pond and whatnot, and I said, isn't there some way we can do something different? And then after we had the, the first meeting there where this idea of these, uh, these rain gardens were at the front and whatnot, and with the topography and whatnot, I kind of started buying into it, and I don't want to say get excited about it, but sounds good to me, and if it works, that was my main concern, was does it work? And he said it does, and I said, well, let's do it, if, if you guys are willing to, to approve that. Um, and I have a couple of other questions, not related to this particular topic. I don't know when it would be suitable to ask those, but... Um, let's, let me uh, get through sure. this, this okay. portion of this. And so, am I a general comfortable consensus here that staff and applicant work, can work using the rain gardens within this buffer? Okay. Thank Do you, guys. You. And then... Jim, uh, of course, let's get you comfortable. What's Do you feel like, you know, there should be text that says rain gardens on the plan? Or how do you guys feel about what's proposed right now in the buffer? I mean, it, it, i got to look at professionals here to tell me whether or not it is specifically the it, rain garden that is going to do the trick the here. It says on the plan, then, proposed stormwater management area. So that could be oh. a mowed swale. It could be anything really but to Janelle's from point. based on conversation it sounds to me that rain yeah. garden seems to be the solution and I think that was what Jamel wanted so to clarify right why don't we have that marked are you comfortable <coughs> having that delineated on your plans no. yeah absolutely okay thank you for clarifying any other thing from staff on that topic that might need more clarification I'm good how about the maintenance plan is it is it inferred Angela that there will be a long-term maintenance plan in chapter 419 is that something 
um, that needs to be defined with the master plan, or can that be a yes, state plan you're right. question? Got it. I think that's at another time. Uh, that's, a, yeah. I guess, a question for Jamil. Oh, okay. Okay. I agree with you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So on to the next uh, care. If you'd like to step back up and ask your question, uh, different topic. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, so uh, getting back to the colors, uh, I am familiar with Grossman's. Um, <laughs> that happened to be where some of my friends uh, worked when we were high seniors in high school here in Scarborough and um, while it was still around. Um, so <clears throat> I guess if I could get a little bit of direction from the board in terms of what um, you're thinking, because when I first saw the orange myself, I, um, I didn't warm up to it, obviously, I agree with you. It's a Miami vernacular and not a Maine vernacular, but at the same time, it kind of symbolizes high tech and whatnot and progressiveness, which I do support. So if you would rather see uh, earth tone colors or colors that are maybe more in keeping with the Maine vernacular, I have no problem with that either. I think it's just helping me to <clears throat> try and get a sense of what the board's looking for because uh, Sean was the one, Sean McGalvery was the one who put this together and he and I had a lot of discussion about the orange and I bought into it <clears throat> after we had had a lot of discussion, but I'm not asking this board to buy into it. I have no problem changing that. I just wanted to let you know kind of what the uh, thought process was in, in going there. Um, and um, I'll, say, I'll say, I think Hunter Orange has its purposes and maybe not on your building. You know, I, I think you can, <laughs> I think you can find you know, we worked with the salt pump, and they, they really pitched that earth tone, you know, kind of blending in with the surroundings type of feel. I'm not saying you have to go that far into it, but I think something softer. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Understood. I, I would also say um, we just approved um, an amendment to the Foley Fitness Center, um, and that is a kind of a slate blue. So you might want to take a look at the colors that are already on the road, uh, or you could certainly take a look, I guess, at the plans uh, and see what the, the colors are there so that there's a consistency uh, between the salt pump, the fitness center, the, uh, uh, I've forgotten what that building is that's down the, close to the corner of uh, Scotto Hill uh, in the apartments. There are a host of colors there uh, it, that I think you could harmonize with. I, I don't say you have to have something that matches every single color um, because you're presenting a, I guess, a, a kind of updated tech building. So I'd be interested in, in seeing something different, but not orange. Okay, I understand. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and are we all set on board questions for the applicant at this point? Okay. Good. Well, that being said, we'll get to the good stuff. Uh, we have a motion, and I will make it. I move to approve the conceptual master plan titled 40 Higgis Parkway, proposed by Magenta LLC, as depicted on the plan set prepared by Stantec, dated 2 11 19, with the following findings and conditions. Findings as stated here. Conditions, the applicant shall revise the conceptual master plan to ensure that A, the required 25-foot landmarked or naturally vegetated streetscape buffer along the Higgis Parkway frontage is maintained, and B, the stormwater management areas at areas will label the stormwater management areas as rain gardens as discussed with the planning board. Two, during the site plan review, the final location of the utility lines, driveway location, and parking will be determined. Three, the applicant shall address the remaining staff review comments in the memorandum dated 2-25-19. These revisions shall be incorporated into the formal site plan application to the planning board. That is the motion. Second. I have a second. Any other discussion? All in favor, please? Opposed? I show that as unanimous. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next up, we have a staff report. Okay. All right, I'll kick this off if I can find what I'm looking for. Here it is. So staff did provide the board with a flyer for the Maine Municipal Association's uh, local planning boards and board of appeal workshop coming up on March 20th, 2019 in Portland. Uh, so just 
just uh, mentioning that this training is happening. They do a really good job. I know that I found it helpful. Um, so it's free for planning board members here at the town. And if you guys are interested, just be sure to let us know and we'll sign you guys up. There's that. Uh, the, uh, with Corey's departure off of the board, uh, there's an opening for the liaison to the long range planning committee, um, which is basically the committee takes a larger look at the land use policies in town. Uh, they're working with staff on the comprehensive plan and once the plan is adopted by council, they'll be working to implement the plan and other such activities uh, related to land use policies. Um, so we're looking for a liaison to that uh, board tonight or committee tonight. Uh, they meet on the first Friday of every month at 8 a.m. And I believe uh, Nick has some ideas about that. I'll leave it at that. And then three, um, so long as I, the folks with Ridgewood Farm Subdivision, the applicants team, did provide staff with a revised plan uh, per, per, per staff comments, and they dropped off the Mylar with those, with those and, and staff signed off on them as okay. So they do have a, there's a Mylar to sign tonight, um, given that that was approved by the board tonight. So we'll have to, if you guys could sign that before you leave, that'd be great. That's what they have. Thank you. Um, so getting back to quickly the long range planning appointee. So it is a member from this board that acts as a liaison for a long range planning committee. Um, I know we already have some members here that are involved in different boards. Here in transportation, correct? Rachel is a conservation. Robin, are you a liaison? Kyle? I'm not. You're not. Rick, you, no. Rick Meinking is on energy, is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Jennifer, are you on any other I boards? I also actually sit on the Transportation Committee yeah, as well. The transportation committee, so. I would be interested in doing a long-range planning. You're interested in doing that? Yep. Okay. Yep. Um, I'd, I'd be satisfied with that if everyone here... Unless you wanted to, Nick. I apologize. I, um, oh no. Um, no, I I was going to take the, um, the step forward if no one else was willing oh, to. So. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'd be happy to. But yes, uh, Friday mornings are First Friday aren't always the, the easiest. For I know, at 8. So. Um, I will fill your heads with ideas, though. Uh, <laughs> reserve that, right? So, <laughs> I'm waiting for the short range appointment. The short, the short range, the short range planning. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So it sounds to me like um, we have uh, an appointment. All in favor of appointing uh, Robin to the long range planning committee. Show that to be unanimous. Congratulations. Can we vote twice on that? And I'll just say Jay Chase, uh, planning director, is the staff for that board. So we'll, yeah. staff will be in touch with you. And Excellent. I'm excited. In regards to that. Thank you. Uh, and then administrative amendment report. <clears throat> there was one administrative amendment report since the last meeting, and that was an updated uh, dumpster enclosure uh, using wooden fencing at Lois's Natural Foods. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any correspondence? Mm -hmm. uh, planning board comments. I have one. Um, we have two new members that are joining us, and I figured now is as good a time as any to pitch the idea of a potential workshop for us as a board. One, to you know, maybe take a couple minutes to get to better know each other, and two, just to kind of go through that refresh. Um, some of the things that I think would be helpful at a workshop like this might be um, how this board uh, interacts with either um, the peer reviewers we use, um, just just in general, why you know why they're there, how we use them, who are they? Um, <coughs> because I think that's going to be helpful, kind of coming into a situation like this. I think um, I think we you know I did talk to Jamila a little bit about maybe some other themes we can throw in there. And I find all of it, I think, once in a while, it's good to take a step back from this public meeting space mm -hmm. to sit back and say, okay, how can we do our jobs better? What are, you know, what are some expectation levels set here? Um, and also get some feedback. Yeah. You know, typically, we just talk at people. It's just, you know, sometimes it's good to listen. So. Um, if that's okay with everyone, we're gonna look into some dates. Jamel, I think, is gonna do a doodle poll send it around and we'll see what we can make work for everyone. Um, and can I, I think ask you a question? Sure. Um, would, I just want to know if the board would prefer a, to couple the workshop with an existing 
meeting date or if you prefer it to be a separate evening. Um, I know sometimes we have long nights, so just curious. If we do it with an existing meeting, it would be somewhat limited for time, right? Because we'd probably start at 6 and have to come, be done. Probably earlier with I don't dinner. Know if that's, yeah, I don't know if that's enough time or not. Or okay. It doesn't matter. I mean, that's just my thought, but mm -hmm. it doesn't... What, Rachel, what do you think? Yeah, yeah I'd kind of like to have it separate, too, so that separate. we're not constantly looking at our watches and thinking, oh, dear, I've got to read that one more time. Mm. Okay. So we'll get the doodle poll out and... Um, figure out what day uh, works for everyone. Uh, and then, any other planning board comments for this evening? Oh. I'd just like to say, i just yeah. like to say you're doing a great job as the new chair. Thank you. It's been, I know, just a couple months, but it's nice to have things, you're doing a great job moving things along really expeditiously. Thank you, appreciate it. <laughs> I think you're doing a great job, too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Rick. We're on camera, so I can't make any snide comments. Uh, wait for you. Let's no. see you in the hall. I'll wait until the light goes off. Uh, do you think that gets us better pizza for the uh, supper, for the planning? Um, I, I would like to thank Jamel for coming to the uh, Conservation Commission and preventing, presenting to the, uh, the commission um, a, an explanation of how we review development plans for the, for the uh, conservation uh, subdivisions. And he came up with an actually a really good two-pager that describes what we look for in terms of uh, conservation subdivision. It was very helpful to the commission folks. And I think, Jamel, if you could send it out to the planning board, sure. because it's a really nice crib sheet yeah. to use when we're looking at, the, uh, at, at a conservation subdivision plan. Um, the folks on the conservation subdivision uh, and the conservation commission really um, appreciated it, and we've set up a process that uh, we're going to use on the commission for taking a look early at any conservation subdivisions that come before us, so that if the conservation commission wants to make a comment or weigh in on a subdivision plan, a conservation subdivision plan, they will do that as a body uh, sometime in between the preliminary site plan and before the final site plan. So that um, this board can hear any observations or suggestions that the commission might have and that can feed into, into our deliberations. So um, it's kind of the uh, a wrap up of the discussions that have been going on for a few months in terms of how the, the conservation, sub uh, conservation commission can help this board uh, with with some of its deliberations around uh, sensitive areas for development. I would like to point out that the Conservation Commission, um, per ordinance, the Planning Board must request uh, assistance from the Conservation Commission. Um, so Rachel or any board member can request that at a board meeting, and it wouldn't automatically go to the Commission. Just a logistical thing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yep. Any other planning board comments for the evening? Yes, Roger. Um, <coughs> I attended the uh, GP Cog Transportation Workshop down at the Saco Town Hall last week with um, Jay was there and Karen Mott was there and Judy Roy, who's on the Transportation Committee with us. And um, basically covering uh, Cumberland and York County and the, all the communities in there. And it's going to be challenging. <laughs> Everybody has their own interests and their own, you know, goals and everything like that. So it's going to be a challenge, whatever they're going to try to do. Focusing primarily on uh, uh, public transportation, trying to come up with the ways of getting there. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Mm. With that, I will make a motion to adjourn. Second. Motion is second. All in favor. Good night, everyone. Thank you. I think you're going to get to the call. You didn't go on the phone. <laughs> <laughs>